Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash for This Week in Prophecy, Sunday, February 24th, 2019. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Welcome to This Week in Prophecy. You know, so much of what is of importance prophetically, particularly in the Middle East, but not only the Middle East, is not only underreported by mainstream media, but it's often underreported in Christian news. Uh, there's a propensity, even among Christians, towards exaggeration, towards sensationalism, towards countdown to Armageddon, get ready, the Lord will be here a week from Tuesday. Rambunction. Now, I believe we're in the last days and Jesus is coming soon and we need to be prepared for his coming and the sun is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And I also believe that that day should not overtake the faithful church as a thief. I believe all of that. But I also understand that people looking at global events, Middle East events, in light of scripture, in light of prophecy, tend to have the finger on the button all the time. You can make qualified statements. This looks like it's potentially adding up to a Gog and Magog scenario described by Ezekiel, if you qualify it that way. But there's too many people who sensationalize things. There are issues of very, very serious importance. For instance, there's new legislation in Iowa that would affect the rights of Christian homeschoolers. Uh, putting control into the hands of bureaucrats, secular bureaucrats, they could be anti-family, they could be anti-Christian, they could be anti-anything, and they have a legal power because of a law that some politicians are trying to pass. Well, okay, that needs to be reported and addressed. Christian needs to need to mobilize to oppose such legislation. That's for sure. But when you have websites sensationalizing it, crackdown on Christian homeschools, it might potentially be that. But you don't motivate people correctly by crying wolf all the time. There is a real wolf out there, and he's coming. Ultimately, it'll be the Antichrist and false prophet. But if you run around yelling wolf all the time, and it's not a wolf, it's just a polecat or something like that, you're doing more harm than you are good, even though your intentions may be sincere. We need to deal with these issues carefully and responsibly. There's a major lawsuit been filed in New York State by a Christian adoption service who are being told by the state bureaucrats in New York, liberals, many of them homosexuals, lesbians, bisexuals, that because you believe that children should only be adopted by traditional families, uh, not people who cohabitate outside of wedlock, not by homosexual marriage couples, but by conventional traditional marriage couples, that a father and a mother, that because that is your policy, you are in violation of state law. Now, you can abort a baby that can survive at nine months fetal gestation and you can kill it. Literally kill a baby that can easily survive maybe without an incubator. That's okay. But if you want to adopt children out to traditional nuclear families and say that a child is better off with a father and a mother in a traditional family structure, you're breaking the law. Now, this shows you how demonic society has become. Remember, people get the government they deserve. This is just wickedness. This is just the prevalence of, 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 of moral debauchery. It's satanic. <clears throat> Why aren't Christians being mobilized to fight these issues more effectively? People are running around worrying about conspiracy theories and all sorts of other things or sensationalizing prophetic, uh, prophetically significant events instead of examining them carefully. And we're missing the target. 
we're not seeing what the enemy is really doing. There are some very serious battles out there that require our prayers and support and action. We need to handle these issues carefully. Jesus said, you'll be despised by all nations for my name's sake. The mainstream media, liberal bureaucrats in states like New York and California, the British Labor Party, they don't hate radical Muslims. Even after September 11th of the London tube attacks, they don't hate radical Muslims nearly as much as they hate born-again Christians. Notice their targets are always Christians and Israel, the people of God and the children of God. It's always their targets. You can witness a terrible arena bombing carried out by radical Muslims or a British soldier hacked to death on the streets of Greenwich, England by Muslims, hacked to death. And they're not worried about Islam as they are about Christians. Uh, you have politicians like Cory Booker and, and Camilla Harris more worried about right-wing terror when it almost, almost doesn't exist. And when it did exist, it was targeted against Jews in Pittsburgh. That racist killer in Charlotte, who I think should be capitally executed if convicted, who shot that church up, he killed people who may have been my brethren in Christ. But that was a racist attack. It was not religio-political. I don't know if I would call it terror. I would just call it racist murder. No, the real threats are being ignored. Christians don't go around murdering people or committing acts of terror. It would be a very odd individual who would do something like that. Yet we are being focused on and targeted as if we're the threat to society. You watch these people who Satan has so deceived to control people's thinking. Ellen DeGeneres or some of the TV nighttime talk shows or if you look at Bill Maher, he's always ragging about believers in Jesus more than any other group or people that he targets. There's a demonic power on back of this. It is lining up with prophecy, with what Jesus said, you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. We've been saying there's a spiritual battle in the American government to get rid of Donald Trump not because he's an angel, but because he's benevolent towards believers. He's showing favor to Christians, and he's pro-life, and he has a vice president who is a saved Christian. There's a spiritual battle. The hatred of him is being demonically driven. It's not about his policies, which are largely successful in most people's opinions. Notice they don't attack him for his policies or the results of his policies. How are you gonna attack lowest record Afro-American unemployment or something like that, you know? Afro-American income for the average family after two terms of Barack Obama, after eight years of Barack Obama, the average income of an Afro-American family declined by $900. In the first 11 months of the Trump administration, the average Afro-American family's income increased by $1,000. The number of people, particularly minorities on food stamps, mushroomed, exploded under Obama. He was the food stamps president. That's his legacy. He bailed out banks. But what did he do for his own people other than put them on the breadline? Their economic lot is improving under the present administration. But the media ignores these facts. It just goes after him. Now, if you disagree with some of his policies, disagree. But it's not about that. There's a demonic power. They're not even dealing with the issues. They're manufacturing issues. They call it fake news. Politically orchestrated witch hunts that have no merit by the deep state. A corruption in the intelligence community and in the Justice Department that tried a coup d'etat. You've got Miller, Mueller, 
who was part of that culture with strike and and the rest of them. He should be investigated himself, yet he's the investigator. He's the special prosecutor. These things are not just political. There is a spiritual battle, what we see in the book of Daniel. There are spiritual battles over these nations. Now, that is true of Iran, certainly. We're told in Daniel 10. And it's true of Israel. There is an election coming on the 9th of April. In this election, you have the organized political left who hate Mr. Netanyahu. Hate him. Forget about the achievements of his administration, particularly economically in the area of high tech. That doesn't matter. The political alliance of Lapid and Gantz are making deals with the Arab parties who are generally left-wing or pro-Islamic in an alignment to try to depose Mr. Netanyahu. Now, if you disagree with some of Mr. Netanyahu's policies, disagree. But it's not about that. When they lose elections, they resort to a misuse of the judiciary with charges that won't stick. They're doing it in America, they're doing it in Israel. Trying to make it impossible for the government to govern because they're worried about being indicted or worried about being sued. It gets worse and worse. This is what is happening. Mr. Netanyahu has been forced as a result of the lapid Gantz alignment to make a deal with the Otsma party, who are far right. They're not really Jewish Nazis. They're not like the Jewish Defense League of Maya Kahani, the mad rabbi from New York. They're not like Kach, his party in Israel was, is. They're not like that. But they are definitely right-wing Jewish nationalists. And the APAC, the American pro-Israel Jewish lobby, is opposed to Mr. Netanyahu making an alliance with them politically. How can so many Jews in the United States, Charles Schumer, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Senator Blumenthal, guilty of fake valor, how can Jews be so stupid as to vote for people from their own community who betray them? I'm not a Republican, I'm an independent, but 81% of Republicans are pro-Israel. About 22% of Democrats are pro-Israel. And we're not only seeing anti-Zionism, we're seeing anti-Semitism. People like Linda Sarsour being given platform. This ridiculous congresswoman from Minnesota who's actually a congresswoman from Mogadishu. She should not even be in the country, let alone in the Congress. A congresswoman from Queens who's actually a congresswoman from Venezuela. Her goal is to do to the United States what Maduro and Chavez did to Venezuela. Amazon was to invest $2.5 billion to have its East Coast base headquarters divided between Washington and New York. New York was getting $2.5 billion in upfront investment in Long Island City, Queens. The East Coast lost its high-tech base that had been associated initially with MIT in the Route 128 area of Boston. Everything went to Silicon Valley and to Seattle. Now there was a chance to bring a high-tech base back to the East Coast and to New York. This crazy, ridiculous socialist killed it. 25 to 30,000 high-paid jobs to say nothing of the longer term tax revenues and spin-off benefits and other jobs that would be created as a result 
of having high income people living and working in a community and in a city. All she thinks about is they got two or three billion in tax credits we could have spent on schools. <laughs> no, they should spend less on schools and let them be charter schools. <laughs> that industry would have generated a lot more in tax revenue within only several years than any benefit it was getting. But it was a competitive offer with other cities. You have to make those deals. And it was killed by her and with the support of de Blasio and the leader of the Democratic Party in the New York State Senate, same ones who want to kill the babies ready to be born. The governor, Cuomo, goes along with it. Charles Schumer says nothing. Did people in New York stay liberal? Jews in New York will still vote for Schumer. A blindness is on these people. I'm not speaking politically here. I'm speaking spiritually. Satan wants to destroy Israel. He wants to destroy the sanctity of human life. To vote for your own death. This is what happens. Again, New York City, New York, city particularly, and California are reaping the fruit of their own corruption, their own moral degeneration, their own ethical breakdown, and of their own stupidity, their self-destructive stupidity and moral degradation. They're reaping the consequence of it. How to be a witness for Jesus in that environment? Quite a challenge. But let's move on. What you see happening in American politics has a parity in Israeli politics. Now in America, the election campaign begins two years before the presidential election. You have a system in America where there's elections for the seats in the House of Representatives every two years. Uh, Many people think it would be better to have term limits. Two terms in the Senate and you're out. Four years, not two years for the House, but two terms and you're out. Not have a professional political class anymore. Abolish the professional political class. Abolish professional politicians. Many people think that. Personally, I tend to be sympathetic to that point of view. Politicians deserve to be out of a job. But that's my view. I'm not trying to make that a Christian position. Let's look and understand what's happening this week in prophecy. Not many people are talking about it outside of strategic circles. Iran claims to have taken over somehow, certainly with the assistance of China and probably Russia, by hacking command and control systems for American UAVs, unmanned armored vehicle, uh, aviation vehicles. In other words, drones, reconnaissance drones and drones that can fire hellfire rockets and so forth. Iran has made these claims. General Amir Ali Hajizadab claims that they have seven or eight, all giving them good intelligence. We know that one was downed in Syria, probably with the help of Russia. The technology went to Russia, and an Iranian drone was built based on the model of the American technology from the American Sentinel. The US MQ-9 Reaper, also known as the Predator B, was downed in 2016. There are now RQ-170s, 
and the Iranians are claiming the capacity to hack into the command and control systems between satellites and the drones, between ground-based guidance systems and the drones. The Iranian Shahad 170 is obviously copied from the American Sentinel. This went down in 2016. This year, however, has seen a dramatic increase in the Iranians trying to play catch up, which they have neither the financial nor technological capacity to do. But what's not being talked about is their cooperation not only with Putin's Russia, but with China. One of these was fired at central Israel. It made its way across the Golan Heights over the Sea of Galilee near Bet Shan before it was downed by an Israeli military jet. It's quite an achievement for the Iranians. The Israelis, of course, responded. But what's happening here? Neither the United States or Israel have the capacity for a terrestrial anti-cruise missile defense system. The United States has developed one to protect aircraft carriers where cruise missiles are not ducking through valleys, ravines, crevices, where they have to go over the open surface of the ocean, it is possible to down a cruise under those conditions. It is not possible under terrestrial conditions. It would have to be extremely flat earth. It would have to be the American Great Plains or the steppes of Russia. But the terrain in the Middle East is not like that. It's not flat. It's all creviced. Even the deserts are moundy. It's sort of like the high deserts in the United States. It's a place where missiles can duck and dodge. Low altitude under the radar horizon. Iran has been developing this capacity with the assistance of Russia and now we know for sure China. The nations of the Middle East going back to the 1960s, have been a proving ground for Western technology versus the technology of the Warsaw Pact, particularly the Soviet Union. Initially, most Israeli armaments up until the 1967 Six-Day War were French. It was French Mirage jets. The Israelis developed a nuclear capacity for nuclear grade plutonium and enriched uranium with the assistance of French scientists. It was not the Americans. That relationship has, of course, gone south long ago. Then it became the United States after the Six-Day War. The United States would test its weapon systems in Israel when Israeli pilots encountered Russian-manufactured or Soviet-manufactured MiG fighters over Syria or over Lebanon, the pilots would be debriefed not only by the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy, but they would be debriefed by McDonnell Douglas, the manufacturers of the F-15. Design modifications were based on Israeli combat experience that continued to give the United States the edge against the Soviet Union. This went on through the 1970s, through the 1980s, and on a different level, it continues to this day. But now the Chinese and the Russians certainly have always played the game, but now the Chinese have joined it. They are using the Iranians, again, as a mock laboratory to improve the development of their weapons systems with stolen technology, largely stolen from the United States. I think it is important that the United States no longer allows students from mainland China to do postgraduate degrees in the United States 
in any STEM field or in corporate management. They should not be allowed to go to Harvard Business School or Wharton. They should not be allowed to do master's degrees or PhDs in Stanford or Caltech or MIT. There should be a ban on students from mainland China doing postgraduate degrees. Israel should likewise carry out such a ban at the Technion, should not allow students from China. They're working against themselves. You're dealing with theft of intellectual property, violation of patent, but also a strategic goal orchestrated by the Chinese Communist government and party. They see everything in terms of military potential. It is not only commercial, it is commercial and military to the regime of China. Now China has become a player in this long drawn out game in the Middle East that the United States and Russia have always played. Proxy war, proxy technological development and improvement and innovation. But this week in prophecy, it gained momentum. The question is, as this capacity improves, will it force Israel to either preemptively or reactively go to war with Iran? This week in prophecy, both Mr. Putin's government, on the eve of talks with Netanyahu's government, announced a pro-Palestinian position that is not simply pro-Palestinian, but pro-Hezbollah. Iran and Russia backing Hezbollah and Lebanon. The obvious plan is to make it possible to have a simultaneous tripod attack on Israel. The first attack would be from Gaza. The second attack would be from Lebanon. The third attack would be from Syria. Israel would be in conflict at two fronts. Now, I don't necessarily mean an invasion of Israeli territory. What I do mean is a 2006-style showering of rocket and missile attacks that can hit not just Haifa or Starot or the southern suburbs of Tel Aviv or Ashdod and Ashkelon, but they can hit anywhere in Israel, including Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. At the same time, although the Palestinian Authority and Hamas are not on speaking terms, the common enemy factor, you'd see a potential third intifada arising in East Jerusalem and on the West Bank. At the same time, Israel is confronting this onslaught by projectiles from both Gaza and Lebanon, as well as the conflict with Syria. It's taking shape. Is it Gog and Magog? I don't know, but Russia is involved. Iran is involved. It's coming from the north. This week in prophecy, it has advanced into a position. Israel has, as it were, in chess terms, castled. It's made some defensive moves. It's had to do that, and it was the right thing to do. It has also made some counter-offensive moves. The Iranians, this week in prophecy, removed their forces further back from the Golan Heights fence, knowing the Israelis could take them out. They will use Hezbollah and proxies instead on the front lines, conducting the operations further back. As we've reported on this week in prophecy over the last two months, the Israeli Air Force, the IAF, has hit specifically Iranian targets inside Syria, as has the United States. But this week in prophecy, in reaction 
to the targeting of American bases by Iranian missiles in North East Syria, close to the Iraqi border. The missiles were found to be targeted. They were aimed. They were not shot as yet. The United States responded by attacking once more Iranian and pro-Iranian Syrian military targets. The United States is bombing the Iranians. The Iranians are targeting the United States. Now, this happens at the same time the tension is being fueled because of Mr. Trump's boycott of Iran and his ban of Iran from trading its currency in dollars through the American currency exchange market. It's created a lot of problems for Iran economically. They're getting more desperate. Iran this week in prophecy has opened a new refinery at uh, Bandar Abbas on the Persian Gulf, close to shipping facilities. However, it is strategically very vulnerable. It will be easy for either the Americans or the Israelis, or for that matter, the Saudis backed by the Americans to take it out and destroy it, as they can take out Cog Island. Iran economically remains highly vulnerable because Israel and the United States, both of them, could easily take out Iran's oil exporting capacity, at least probably 80% of it, and do so rather easily. Not only that, but Iranian exports are not as important as they were, as we've been saying. Because of American fracking, declining production in Venezuela, and declining exports from Iran are not a factor anymore in sending the price of oil through the ceiling as they one time would have been. It's just not happening. This adds to their own frustration and desperation. We no longer have the oil weapon. What can we do? The Israelis are saying these people are getting a cruise missile and drone capacity rivaling our own. They're determined and desperate. What are we going to do? This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy. Amman. The military intelligence branch of the IDF, it's roughly the equivalent of the American NSA and DIA combined, not CIA, but DIA combined, put forth a predicted scenario where you would have this coordinated north-south attack on Israel using these missiles. And it's not just the old Katusha's which could be damaging enough. Now we have newer generations of Russian and Iranian manufactured projectiles using Russian and potentially Chinese technology. Amman is very, very careful. It has had one crisis after another because of failure to give adequate intelligence predictions. And so now it is super careful. Most of the military commanders of Amman have been removed under negative conditions. There have been exceptions. Amman was largely blamed, not completely, but largely blamed for the near disaster of the Yom Kippur War. Hence, they become extremely cautious, extremely cautious. Perhaps they are exaggerating something for fear of something happening that they didn't predict. They don't want to repeat what happened, obviously, in 1973. On the other hand, they've become quite meticulous in their appraisals. They're not like the Mossad or like Shin Bet. They're not like the other branches of Israeli intelligence. They operate purely from a strategic focus. They don't take into account much 
political thinking the way Mossad does. They're only concerned with the strategic military operations and potential military operations. And they say we can no longer, or Israel can no longer ignore what Iran is doing, nor can it ignore the hand of Russia and China in it. They said that this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, there was a stalemate in talks between Patrick Shanahan, the American Secretary of Defense, and the government of Egypt Erdogan in Turkey. Over American support for the Kurds and their cause indirectly in Iraq and in Syria. This has become an underreported situation in itself. Follow what I'm saying. It was Erdogan's hope and even expectation that when Mr. Trump announced the American withdrawal coming from Syria, that Turkey would move in then, that Iran would move in. United States said to Turkey, don't do that. And there was even pressure from Russia not to do that because Russia leans more towards Assad and there is tension between Syria and Turkey. He couldn't do it. He was ready to pounce, go into the vacuum left by the Americans, but he was basically forced to stop by a combination of American and Russian diplomatic influence that was more than just diplomacy. Of this we may be assured. If the Americans armed the Kurds sufficiently, which is one of the things the Turks are afraid of, if they armed the YPG sufficiently, they could do a lot of damage to Turkey and to the Turkish military. What has been the reaction of Turkey in this breakdown of negotiations with the Americans concerning American support for the Kurds, which could translate to support for YPG and for the PYD? Well, on one hand, they underscored that Turkey remains a NATO member and that the underlying fundamental strategic cooperation is intact. But of course, that is political window dressing. That's the way the diplomatic game is played. And that's what it is, a game. It is like a dance with certain steps. Having said that, he's put on a tremendous show in Turkey. Mr. Erdogan has announced the trial after the arrest of Daoud Dagestani, the president of the Israeli-Kurdish Friendship Alliance, making the accusation that this Turkish Kurd is an agent of the Israeli Mossad and possibly of the American Central Intelligence Agency. So on one hand, He's putting this guy on trial for being a spy for the Americans and the Israelis. At the same time, he's trying to negotiate with the Americans and say, well, we're still allies. He's in quite a quagmire. Like Iran, his economy is not doing well. Clausewitz, the military historian, rightly said, war is simply the extension of diplomacy. Or maybe the result of failed diplomacy, but the extension of diplomacy. Diplomacy, however, is the extension of politics, clause which didn't go that far. And politics is the extension of economics. Ultimately, it's money that talks. When these economies get in trouble, social and political instability become feared. This is why the government of China is always walking on eggs. It's why they have a social credit system. They know if the economy really slides, 
Social instability will translate into political unrest. They've never forgotten Tiananmen Square. But let's move on. That's what transpired in Turkey this week in prophecy. February 3rd, there were multiple Iranian sites hit by the American Air Force inside of Syria. Whether there has been further American airstrikes, we do not know. But it sends a signal to Putin, to Iran, to the Assad regime, but also indirectly to Turkey, that the United States, the Trump administration, means business. He's not like Barack Obama, who drew the red line and stood there while it turned pink and then disappeared. He's not like Obama. He's not like John Kerry. Mike Pompeo is not like John Kerry. Thus far, the Trump administration says what it means and means what it says. This week in prophecy. The story then continues. The Israeli election, events in Iran, and of course, events in Syria and Iraq. But now, it even goes beyond that. News headlines were made in Israel this week that Israel became the fourth nation to go to the moon in a matter of speaking. It has placed a research robot on the lunar surface in a joint launch effort with the United States from Cape Canaveral in Florida. The Falcon 9 was launched from Cape Canaveral but it's an Israeli design, an Israeli technology. Uh, Israel being the fourth country to get to the moon, how be it with the assistance of the United States. This also has potential implications for an American return to the moon and a possible strategic role of the lunar surface for events on Earth. The militarization of space has long been spoken of, ever since the 1960s. They talked about peace and the brotherhood of man and advancement of science. But now Mr. Trump has called literally for a space force. Air Force, Navy, Army, we're going to have a space force if he has his way. And a joint venture with the Israelis in a lunar project, which we know has certain defense applications. Everything the Israelis do has a defense application, much like China, and often like the United States, but certainly the Israelis. It begins to take a particular shape that is disturbing to countries who don't like Israel. And it took place this week in prophecy. Also, this week in prophecy, in the UK, the continued debate within the Labour Party that is seeing an erosion of membership from the Labour Party over two issues. One is the position of Labour on Brexit, deal or no deal, but secondly, is the traditional Jewish support for labor. Now, Benjamin Disraeli was a conservative, and he was a Jewish Christian, a believer in Jesus as the Messiah. But most British Jews voted labor the way most American Jews vote Democrat or have voted Democrat. The outspoken anti-Zionism, and even what many describe as anti-Semitism, of the shadow government of Jeremy Corbyn is at last beginning to wake up some Jews. Labor's shadow chancellor this week in prophecy, John McDonald, an enemy of Israel, responded to the debate over whether the British should allow a British Muslim woman who joined ISIS to return to the UK. There is a similar situation in the United States with a Muslim woman 
from Alabama, who the American State Department says is not an American and has no legal right to come back. But there is a situation in Britain where there's another such situation with this woman. Now, this woman behaved like a vicious animal. She joined ISIS. Anyone who joins ISIS is a vicious animal. Um, people like her belong in Guantanamo. That's where they belong. They should be denationalized and sent to a Guantanamo and just left there. Odd infinitum. There's nothing else you can do with them other than capitally execute them. Or you can hand them over to a Muslim country that will behead them. That is another way to deal with such people. I'm not saying I advocate this. I'm simply pointing out the political and legal realities. This woman is trying to get back into the UK desperately. Her family is a Muslim lawyer and they're saying she's willing to stand trial. Uh, the British legal system is so weak and so afraid of the Muslim community that she will never, never face true justice. She'll never face the possibility of execution for treason or life imprisonment even. It won't happen. Uh, it's best just not to let her back. But against this background of this debate, some are saying she should come back and have to stand trial. Others are saying she left to join ISIS. She's no longer British. She's denationalized. Don't let her back. The British shadow chancellor, John McDonald, said that the British police should question British Jewish young people who have gone to Israel and asked whether they have joined or been conscripted into the IDF. They should be treated the way ISIS terrorists are treated. This is after the London tube attacks. This is after the Rushdie riots. This is after the arena attacks in Manchester. British law allows for dual national citizenship. The United States is stricter and will only allow it in certain conditions. Britain has a more liberal policy. If Britain allows for dual national citizenship, and this has to do with the breakup of the empire and so forth, there were colonial British people living abroad that when the empire collapsed and replaced by the Commonwealth, they were offered citizenship in countries like India or Pakistan or so forth. And so the British government allowed them to have two passports. Hence, as a result of the collapse of empire, Britain has a different legal and political approach to dual citizenship than the United States. Understandably, for historical reasons, how it came to be that. Israel was at one time a British mandate. You had 30,000 Jews from what is today Israel who fought under Montgomery in the British Legion against the Nazis. 30,000. Every one of them a volunteer. The former president of Israel was a colonel in the Royal army during the Second World War, Heim Herzog, the founder of the Israeli Air Force, Ezra Weizmann, had been a British fighter pilot in the Second World War. Now we are told that their sons and grandsons for defending a democracy against Islamic terror should be treated the same way as ISIS people coming back to Britain. Except that McDonald didn't say she should be arrested. This is what's happening. It's ridiculous. And it's getting worse.
I pray to God Corbyn never becomes the Prime Minister of Great Britain. It'll bring God's judgment on the United Kingdom. But it happened, and it happened this week in prophecy. Please continue to pray for Mr. Trump, whether you agree with him politically or not, for his administration. Please continue to pray whether you agree with him politically or not for Mr. Netanyahu and his government. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the believers in Israel, Jew and Arab. And pray that despite this terrible situation, the gospel will prosper. We also ask prayers for the legal battle taking place in New York and the political battle taking place in Iowa. You can avail yourself of these things on the internet. It's worth a letter and certainly worth a prayer. Jesus is indeed coming soon. We have been called to strengthen the things that remain and to prepare the way for his return. May he give us the grace, the wisdom, and the capacity to do that. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless.